going online now. It takes a minute, says Hyrule. <laughs> and we have to start on time. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, we have two more minutes. Mm -hmm. Also already start sharing the slide. Can you see it? And I guess then we can start. So welcome everyone to the SPICE and SPIN Plus X online seminar organized by Hyrule Sinova, Martin Eschliemann, Burkhard Hillebrands, Matthias Kloy, and myself. As usual, that's a webinar format. So you can ask questions um, at the end by either lifting your hand or by writing them into the chat. Today we have Kirsten uh, von Bergmann as a speaker. She did her PhD in 2004 uh, at the University of Hamburg. Then she was a visiting researcher at IBM in the US. Afterwards, she took on a lectureship at the University of Hamburg, where she is currently uh, a permanent researcher. Her research interests center around non-collinear magnetic order, skirmions, where she's well known in the community, and higher order magnetic interactions. And she has uh, won several awards. One of them is the Gaeta Prize of the German Vacuum Society. So we're looking very much forward to the talk from Kirsten, who is about nanoscale skirmions and atomic scale spin textures studied with STM. They can go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm also very much looking forward to the talk. I'm very excited to give the talk in this uh, wonderful lecture series here. Um, I enjoy it very much, even though um, I cannot often make it on the on the Wednesdays. Um, but I find it very nice that it's online afterwards and one can uh, um, watch it anytime and press the pause button to rethink what was said and so on. So thank you very much um, for also including me in this very nice lecture series. And um, I want to discuss today nanoscale and atomic scale spin textures. So um, what do we need to uh, have nanoscale or atomic scale spin textures? Well, the easiest way is probably to have an anti-ferromagnetic interaction because that immediately gives us atomic scale magnetic order. But then there's other interactions around that also uh, play a role. For example, um, what we call exchange frustration. And what we mean with this is that there's not only um, an interaction between the nearest neighbor magnetic moments, but also between next nearest neighbor moments. And if, for example, um, they are competing um, so that one of them is ferromagnetic and the other one is anti-ferromagnetic, um, they can form a non-collinear magnetic state, such as a spin spiral, for example. Then, of course, we also have the jaloshinsky moria interaction, which um, arises due to spin orbit coupling and broken inversion symmetry, and it can also lead to this canting between um, nearest neighbor moments. Um, and because we are working typically um, at surfaces, um, 
we can always expect to have an impact of interface-induced uh, DMI interaction. And um, this is the set of interactions that I want to start my talk with. And then in the second half of the talk, there will be um, additional terms that can play a role. So we use spin polarized scanning tunneling microscopy to investigate these nanoscale atomic scale magnetic states. And you can think of it basically as a TMR effect um, in STM geometry. So we are using a magnetic tip to probe our magnetic sample. And then depending on whether tip and sample um, have a parallel magnetization or an anti-parallel magnetization, the tunnel current changes. So in this way, we are sensitive um, to relative magnetization direction variations of the sample. Um, in total, the spin polarized tunnel current then changes with the cosine of tip and sample magnetization. In this way, we not only get the atomic resolution that you know from STM, but also um, the magnetic sensitivity. And um, our experiments are done model type systems, which we prepare in, in ultra high vacuum. Um, and our measurements are typically performed at um, liquid helium temperature, and we can apply perpendicular magnetic fields to our samples. Now, um, to introduce you to this method and how it works, um, I would like to use our one of our favorite model systems for non-collinear magnetic order, which is um, a palladium iron bilayer on an iridium substrate. So we have a iridium 111 um, crystal, which is stepped. Then we deposit a single layer of iron on top. So that's what you see here. There's still some iridium to be seen. And then in addition, we deposit a layer of palladium. And on this palladium iron, which grows pseudomorphic, so the atoms are basically just the flat structure, we see these stripes. And this is our magnetic um, signal. And we interpret this magnetic signal, these stripes, as a spin spiral phase as depicted here. Right? So, um, for instance, if our tip magnetization is up, then we see these red lines as a bright signal and these green lines as a um, darker signal. And that's how these stripes come about. Um, and the spin spiral here is uh, due to the competition between exchange interaction and jaloshinsky moria interaction. And if we apply an external magnetic field, um, our uh, magnetic state changes. Here we are in the mixed phase of spin spiral and these dots here. And at even higher field, it's only the dots. And then at two Tesla, we saturate the sample um, and it is in the ferromagnetic state. So we would like to claim that this is a skirmian lattice phase as depicted here. But how do we actually know that these blobs are really skirmians? In our experiment, they just appear as red blobs. So um, with SP, STM, we can uh, do an experiment to prove that these are skirmions. So if you have a tip that's magnetized along the tip axis, it is sensitive to the out-of-plane components of magnetization. So if you have a skirmion, um, you will image it as a dot, as depicted here. However, if you have a tip that's magnetized parallel to the surface plane, you're sensitive to in-plane components along the tip magnetization axis. And then the skirmion appears with a two-lobe structure, as you see here. Now we see that all these skirmions have um, the same two-lobe structure, and they do it everywhere on the sample. Um, and that is a characteristic of their unique rotational sense, right? So from this kind of measurement, we can infer that these are indeed um, magnetic skirmions induced by the jaloshinsky moria interaction. And um, we can now analyze this data further. We can take line profiles um, to map the magnetization across such a skirmion and these 
black circles are the data points, the experimental data points, and the red line is a fit to two overlapping 180 degree domain walls, the standard um, equation for that. And from this, we can then derive the magnetization texture on an atomic scale. All right, so this would be the MZ component, and this is um, the spin structure in real space. And if we do this at different magnetic fields, we can see that the spermion shrinks as the magnetic field is increased, as it is expected, and we can analyze um, the size and the shape of the magnetic spermions as a function of distance from the center. And you can see that in one Tesla, for example, um, the spermion is larger with a diameter on the order of four nanometer, whereas a two and a half Tesla, the diameter is on the order of two nanometer only. And um, the rotation in the center of the spermion is much faster. Now, this looks very similar to what was uh, proposed long ago um, using this energy functional here. So now if we have all this information and the energy functional describing it, we can actually derive the material parameters um, just from our experimental data. We have to input uh, the saturation magnetization, and then we can derive the exchange stiffness, the jaloshinsky moria interaction, and the uniaxial anisotropy for our system. And if we then put that back into a simulation code, we see that it agrees very nicely with our experimental data. So PSTM seems to be a very useful tool to characterize such skirmion materials. Actually, with STM, we have another access to the magnetic properties, um, which is maybe not as obvious. So when we're using a non-magnetic tip, we still see the skirmions. And um, because this will be used um, also in the following, following during my talk, I will explain it a little bit. It is due to what we call the non-collinear magneto resistance effect. So basically here, you're in the ferromagnetic background and you get a certain um, conductance. And then when you are um, on top of a skirmion, you have this non-collinear spin structure and obviously the signal is smaller. And this non-collinear magneto resistance um, is basically tells you that um, the magnetic state has a different electronic structure when it is non-collinear, which is due to the mixing of spin up and spin down bands. So that's the concept. Collinear is different to non-collinear. The electronics is different. Um, and that's exactly what we probe with STM. So this is a more detailed experiment. So we have these skirmions here, a larger one at one Tesla, a smaller one at two and a half Tesla. And these cones actually represent um, our magnetic atoms. So this skirmion is really um, made up out of a couple of dozens of atoms. If, if we um, take a um, scanning tunneling spectroscopy outside here in the ferromagnetic regime, we get this kind of spectrum, which reflects the local density of states. If we take it in the skirmion center here of the big skirmion, where the spins are still um, somewhat collinear, but already twisting, this peak shifts to here. So if we go to the center of this very small skirmion, where the nearest neighbor angles are already large, this peak shifts to even higher energies, right? This, is, um, this reflects the change of the electronic states within our material, depending on the nearest neighbor angle due to mixing of spin bands. And this is exactly what we probe in STM, and that's why we see them with a non-magnetic tip. One can also um, look at it in real space, of course, and this, very, th this kind of skirmion, which has a non-collinearity, strong non-collinearity in the center, looks like this dark 
blob, whereas this larger Sturmian, the, um, the region with the highest non-collinearity is actually here near the in-plane region, and that why, that's why it appears as a ring structure. Right? So um, our colleagues also did um, DFT calculations, not of a Skirmian, but of a ferromagnetic palladium iron, right? exactly this material, and a non-collinear spin spiral. And you can see um, the red and the green spaghetti, they present the spin up and spin down um, electronic states. And you see that within the same material, the palladium iron, they are different depending on whether they are collinear or non-collinear. So this difference then leads to this change in our experiments and enables us to image skirmions with non-magnetic tips, which can be very useful um, for practical reasons. Now, this palladium iron has the spin spiral at zero field. And you can see that it likes to connect to the edges, right? The spin spiral stripes, they want to be perpendicular to the edges of this iron. Now, it's not always useful if the spin structures connect to the edge, right? If you think about the Skirmian racetrack and the Skirmians um, can be deflected and then they connect to the edge and they can escape out of the racetrack, that's not what we want. So we were thinking on how we can actually modify this material um, in order to um, repel the skirmions from the edge maybe, or to modify it in any case. So um, we modify the rim and we deposit cobalt onto our system and then it attaches next to the palladium, right? So here in the center, this is the topography with palladium iron and then attached to it is cobalt iron. And now, if we look at the magnetic state of this island, we see that it's that there's drastic changes. The spin spiral arms, they are now parallel to the edges, right? Only at regions where there's no cobalt, they again connect in a perpendicular fashion to the boundary. So there's a strong effect of this cobalt, which is magnetized in the sample plane, on the spin texture within this island. And if we look at several different islands, um, we can see this. Now this is imaged with the NCMR. So we see uh, each spin spiral has two lines. It's a magnetic period is two lines here. And we see that all of them, they are sort of um, forced into the island. The spin structure is forced into the island. Um, and we see that everywhere. And if we look closely, and um, even more so in small islands, we see that we have all these circles here that are um, skirmions in the virgin state, right? And here we have two circles, which is basically um, a target skirmion. And here we have nearly three circles. The third circle has a small gap here, but that goes in the direction of multi-pi skirmion states. So we think this is very interesting that by modifying the edge, we can actually generate these states in the virgin state. Now, of course, we are also interested what happens in magnetic field when we are in the skirmion phase. And this is what we see. So we have some skirmions in the center, and it depends on what voltage we use, if we write in there more skirmions or less skirmions. But we, what we also see is these skirmions here that are attached to the rim. It becomes very apparent here in this small island. What we also see is these sort of spin spiral stripes at the rim. And if we look closely, we find a correlation of the, um, of the rim here, of the cobalt, and with what we have. That's what these white lines are indicating. So here, the, this reconstruction of the cobalt iron is perpendicular, and that promotes these skirmions sitting at the rim. 
which you also have here, that when the stripes of the reconstruction are parallel, we get these parallel stripes. So we think that this is um, this can be related to the magnetization direction within the um, cobalt. So here the magnetization direction is like this, and here the magnetization direction is like this in the um, cobalt outside. So um, to test this, we did some uh, simulations where um, we are having different regions, the palladium iron, then a transition regime, and this cobalt, which is magnetized in different directions. Whereas it doesn't matter if it's magnetized left or right, there's a big difference whether the magnetization points towards the boundary or away from the boundary. And that, of course, is due to the DMI, which favors some sort of rotational sense also at the edge, as we know it from the edge tilt. Um, and while I'm just flashing um, these simulations here, from which you can sort of understand a little bit that there is uh, single spermions and also these elongated objects at the rim, um, I would like to um, go a little bit more into the details of what we did in these simulations and why we did it. So if you look at this region here, here we have palladium iron and we experimentally determined the magnetic parameters of um, palladium iron. So we put them into the um, simulation core. Then here we have um, the cobalt iron reconstruction. It's uniaxial. Um, we choose some larger J to mimic the larger magnetic moment because it's two layers of um, magnetic moment, which is constant in the simulation. And we add an in-plane uniaxial anisotropy because we know it's magnetized in-plane and we know it's uniaxial. And then we have this slim transition regime here, which is sort of um, a mixture. It also has some um, in-plane anisotropy, but um, it's isotropic because it's not uniaxial in this sl slim region here. So now, if we choose these parameters and write a skirmion at the position of this cross, we see that it's attracted to this um, boundary here and it stays there. Now, obviously, these parameters are a little bit random because we don't know them. So we just sort of did a systematic variation of parameters to just try to extract some general physics. And that's what we get. If we just change the J only in this transition regime, we see that um, for small J, the skirmion strips out. And then as we increase the J, uh, the skirmion detaches from the rim. So here's a repulsive interaction, right? And the skirmion somehow gets sucked into this region because it likes to be there. Now, um, equivalently, we can vary the value of the DMI and we get a very similar effect. So um, in general, we can just say that if you modify the rim and you change the parameters, the, the D or the J, then you can repel or attract the skirmions to this modified region. And um, similar to our experiments, this has been shown recently in other experiments um, where they modified the magnetic anisotropy, either by weakening it with um, bombardment um, of, of helium atoms or by lithography, they um, got a higher PMA and they found a very similar thing. So it seems to be a general phenomenon that the skirmions can be pinned or repelled from edges or tracks by modifying the material parameters. And now going back, to the experiments in magnetic field. This is um, at two Tesla, and we have some skirmions in the interior and these long um, elongated objects at the rim. And if we now release the magnetic field, um, we see that the skirmions grow in size. And we also see that they are repelled 
by this edge and they just stay spermions even though they are at zero magnetic field. So this is um, one way to have zero field magnetic spermions in the remnant state. However, um, they cannot be isolated. There would be just a single spermion that would just strip out. So they can only be there as an ensemble but maybe for applications, it's nice to have isolated single magnetic spermions in zero magnetic field. And this is the topic of the next um, chapter of my talk. So our theory colleagues, um, they calculated not iron, but also cobalt on iridium. And they found that um, if you vary the nearest neighbor angle, you have to pay an energy penalty. So zero degrees between na nearest neighbor moments um, is the ground state, the ferromagnetic state. And then you have this quadratic um, behavior here as you vary the nearest neighbor angle, just as in the micromagnetic model. Now, they found that if you add a layer of rhodium on top, this changes dramatically. You see this very flat dispersion here. And that basically means if you vary the angle by up to about 15 degrees, you don't have to pay energy, right? That's what this plot is telling you. And that this comes um, from strong exchange frustration. And now we try to do this experiment. We're growing this material because it doesn't look this nice, but that's a realistic um, side view of the sample. So we have these cobalt stripes here, and then we have all the rhodium islands on top. And in the next slide, we'll be looking at these two rhodium cobalt islands. And um, we looked at them with two different bias voltages. And at this bias voltage, um, the TMR is very strong, so dark, is down and orange is up magnetized, so it's ferromagnetic. Um, however, we see that there's uh, a lot of domain walls on this small sized islands, unusually long domain walls. And the other bias voltage, we hardly have magnetic contrast, only a little bit from dark blue to medium dark blue. But we see these bright lines, and these are the domain walls due to the non-collinear magnetic resistance <clears throat> effect. Now, I would um, like to point your attention um, at these guys indicated here. So this is a down domain within an up surrounding, and this is an up domain and down surrounding, or we could also uh, call it skirmium. So this is an up skirmium and a down spermion in the magnetic virgin state. And we can show from this data that actually these walls have unique rotational sense. So indeed, they are real spermions. And um, we can measure their size. Um, and the diameter is on the order of four nanometer, the domain wall width in the order of one, one nanometer. And if we do simulations, um, we actually find very good agreement um, with the data. So indeed, we have magnetic spermions in zero magnetic field and they are isolated. So why don't they collapse? They are only four nanometer in diameter. Why don't they just flip and go to the ferromagnetic state? And this is again where theory um, helped us and the typical collapse mechanism uh, for spermions is just they shrink until they are gone. Right, so if you do natural elastic band method, you have this skirmion and then you go step by step. And, and here at the settle point, there is no blue magnetization component anymore and it just snaps and it's gone. And the anisotropy and the exchange, they just love that path and the DMI hates it. But overall, the total energy just has a very small energy barrier for this process. And that's why normally skirmions just collapse. So what's different with our skirmions? Well, it's all about the exchange frustration, which enhances skirmions' stability. So here the exchange 
the frustrated exchange actually contributes to the energy barrier and generates this very high energy barrier. And that's why they don't collapse. And these are basically images from this path. But it was actually calculated 1.2 Tesla. So we're not talking about the zero field stonians yet, but they also did this calculation and they found a very high energy barrier as well at zero field, but the collapse mechanism is different. It doesn't just shrink and collapse from the center, but in this case, it sort of the it, it is cut from the side and then it collapses from here. So, and because this mechanism costs so much energy, and this one costs even more energy at zero magnetic field, our spermians are so stable. And this kind of mechanism was also um, proposed to occur in canted magnetic fields um, for palladium iron with experimental um, data. So indeed, we can have isolated zero field magnetic spermians and um, they can be stabilized due to strong exchange frustration. And with this, uh, I finished the talk about skirmions, and now I want to come to the additional interactions that can play a role, as I announced at the beginning of the talk, and namely those are um, geometric frustration, which lead to non-collinear magnetic order, for example, anti-ferromagnetic interactions on a triangular lattice, and higher order interactions, where um, more than two spins are involved or a coupling between more spins is involved. So they are all um, interactions between four spins that either, either sit on two sides, three sides, or four sides. Now, um, let's look at the geometric frustration. You have a hexagonal lattice and anti-ferromagnetic coupling, just the J1, the ground state is the near state with 120 degree angle between nearest neighbors, neighbor moments. And the unit cell has three atoms. If there's a competition between J1 and J2, so frustrated exchange, the ground state is a row-wise anti-ferromagnetic state. So this row is spin down, this row is spin up, down, up, right? Now, this row-wise anti-ferromagnetic state will then occur in three rotational domains. And this is what we would call three rotational domains of a one Q state, but then you can make a superposition to a multi Q state and you get this two dimensionally modulated three dimensional spin texture. And here, the nearest neighbor angle is always the tetrahedron angle and the magnetic unit cell has four atoms in the unit cell. And this state was predicted for manganese on copper 111, but experimentally one just cannot prepare this, so it has not been found. Um, and now the higher order interactions actually decide if the 1Q state is the ground state or the 3Q state is the ground state. Um, and I think this is very interesting um, to look for such sort of uh, magnetic states. Now, um, several experimental and theory works have already um, dealt with such higher order uh, magnetic interactions. And then you can have uh, this sort of um, nanoskirmian lattice induced by, stabilized by higher order interactions in zero magnetic field or you can have an anti-ferromagnet, which in addition has um, a conical modulation um, or um, a canted up, up, down, down state has been found as depicted here or a collinear up, up, down, down state like a double row-wise anti-ferromagnet. And there's um, a lot going on in this direction. And um, in addition to the three interactions that I have written down a few slides before, there's many more that are being considered um, currently, um, and some of them you will find also in these publications here. Um, now I would like to focus on the system of a manganese monolayer on a rhenium 
0.01 crystal. And um, what you see here is the FCC stacked manganese monolayer, and you see these stripes. So these stripes are along the closed peg row, and we basically see every second row. So this is the row-wise antiferromagnetic state. And as you would expect, it occurs in different rotational domains, one, two, and three. Now, this is also manganese, but it's a different stacking. It's, it's the HCP stacking of manganese. And you can immediately see that it has a different magnetic state. It has um, a hexagonal superstructure. And I will discuss this in the next slide. And then after discussing the HCP, I will also talk about what you see here, the domain walls between rotational um, domains. Now, this is a zoomed image of the HCP manganese monolayer with the hexagonal superstructure. And you can, um, in this atomic resolution image, you can clearly see the P2 by 2 superstructure with four atoms in the unit cell. So in this case, it is actually this 3Q state that was proposed um, 20 years ago for a different system. It, is, it finally appeared in the manganese monolayer um, and it must be induced by higher order interactions. And it is um, equivalent to the superposition of the three rotational domains of the row-wise antiferromagnetic state, but it is stabilized by these higher order interactions. And this is a picture of it. But actually, when we closely analyze our data, we see that it looks slightly different in different areas. And this is not compatible with this image here measured with an out of plane tip. It should look the same everywhere. But there's different rotations of this magnetic state. And from our data, we can conclude that this is the state that we have. And this can also occur in rotational domains. And it's not absolutely clear yet why it is this one and not a different one. But there's some um, theory inside in this paper here. Now, going back to the row wise, um, you can have domain walls in antiferromagnets. For example, if areas don't match up, this would be a phase domain wall. Then in our system, you can also have rotational domain walls as, as you've seen in the experimental data. Now, there can also be um, domain walls between um, such rotational domain walls, we call them orientational domain walls, and um, they can be 60 degree domain walls, or they can also be 120 degree domain walls if they run in this direction. So maybe you have some idea how this transition can take place from one um, antiferromagnetic row to the other one. We have the experimental tools to actually look at it. And this is what we find. So here we have some cobalt atoms that pin the wall. So it um, doesn't um, move somewhere that it doesn't shrink. So we have the two wall types that I discussed before here. And in particular here, you see that there's some um, substructure in it that is not in agreement with the continuous rotation going across from one domain to the next. And here in, in this sample area, um, we are lucky to have some impurities in our sample that uh, pin the domain wall and open it up. So it becomes broad, that's due to the pinning. Here we can clearly see um, the hexagonal um, superstructure within the domain walls. So why is that? Um, it is clearly a P2 by 2 structure, and you can already see in this image the proposal of the magnetic state. It's definitely not a coherent rotation of the sublattice, see? But we propose, or we know, that it is something that we call a superposition wall. So what is it? These are simulations. So you have these two rotational domains, and they, when they come across each other in the domain world, they just coexist. They form a superposition state. 
we will call it a two Q state. And that happens for both the 120 degree wall and the 60 degree wall. And these simulations have been done with this Hamiltonian here. So you need the J1 and the J2 to actually get this row wise state. There's an in plane anisotropy. Um, don't worry about this too much. I will not discuss it, but it's also essential. And most importantly, here, um, the biquadratic interaction, um, which is one of the higher order interactions. And these parameters are actually um, inspired by the DFT calculations for exactly this system. Now, this is the Q, two Q state, and you can see that in the wall, it is reminiscent of this state here, right? So a superposition wall. Now, if you change the value of the higher order interactions, you can see that you can change the width of that antiferromagnetic domain wall. And if you look at these circles here, you can see that adjacent atomic rows rotate in opposite directions across this wall, across these walls to make these two Q state. And if you stare long enough at all these colored circles, you can actually um, come up with analytical formulas for these domain walls and these antiferromagnets. So for comparison, here's also the ferromagnetic domain wall. Um, which of course depends, width depends on the ratio of A over K and the energy depends on um, A times K. Now for these two walls as depicted here, it is a little bit different. So the anisotropy doesn't play a role at all. In this system is just an in-plane anisotropy. However, you can immediately see that the higher order interaction plays a role both for the wall width and the wall energy. What you can also see is that one domain wall type only depends on J2 and the other one only depends on J1. So basically, basically these, the ratio between these numbers will tell you if in your material, you will find this one more often or this one more often. In any case, the width is strictly also determined by the higher order interactions. So this is um, something that we find very interesting that the really higher order interactions will um, first couple adjacent um, domains to form a superposition state and then also determine the width and the energy. Um, of course, you can have superposition walls also in other types of ferromagnets. It's not necessarily a, a hexagonal lattice, but you can also have it on a square lattice, right? On a square lattice, antiferromagnet, you can have these two different types. And in particular, this one is susceptible to form um, such superposition walls because, because you can have rotational domains for this one. Um, and this is the superposition state of two rotational domains. And if you make a simulation of this um, row-wise antiferromagnetic state on a square lattice, you see that you can have this phase domain wall just shifted. Or if you have um, an orientational domain wall, you get this superposition wall, the 2Q wall, where again, the value of the higher order actually determines uh, the width and the energy. Now, um, with these higher order interactions, up to now, I've only been discussing this very simple 1Q, 2Q, 3Q states of this row-wise antiferromagnetic state, which is a perfect superposition state. But uh, maybe I forgot to tell you that usually there's a constraint of constant magnetic moment in the resulting multi-Q superposition state. Um, well, for larger magnetic unit cells, it's not always possible to find a superposition state where the magnetic moment is constant. But that is absolutely necessary, uh, for example, for an iron monolayer, because the intraatomic exchange is so large that you can't just quench the atomic moment at will. Um, now, 
For example, this system here, it has the hexagonal magnetic state, but it has uh, 12 atoms in the unit cell, and it actually exists like this at zero magnetic field. So um, one cannot find a superposition state where the magnetic moment is constant. Well, we thought we will try it anyways. Okay? If we just take these uh, three Q vectors here and make a superposition state, and then see what we get and put all the magnetic moments to the same value to have them constant. And that's the result. Um, and we think this is uh, a good description of this magnetic state here. And actually, I think that's what most other people just do. They take the three Q values and make a superposition state. I mean, this is then, uh, this is from the Mühlbauer paper, right? This is the first Skirmian lettuce that was seen in experiments. And um, they try to describe it with the, as this sort of multi-Q state that goes back to the question, is the Skirmian lettuce um, a multi-Q state or is it a condensation of particles? So maybe it's not so clear. And um, also other people just do a superposition state or um, a lot of times in the constant context of frustrated exchange. So I think these hexagonal ones, they usually occur in magnetic field, but then there's also very many that um, occur without external magnetic field as we find experimentally here. And there's all these uh, recent um, works of square and hexagonal atomic scale magnetic states um, that are described as multi-Q states. Um, I also would have had some in my talk, but time is up. So I think I should just go to the summary slide. Um, so I've discussed nanoscale uh, magnetic experiments, um, and we see them both in SP, SDM, and in NCMR imaging. And we can characterize them on the atomic scale. And we have used um, a modification of the rim to modify the spin texture in the interior of the island. And um, with this, we get zero field skirmions, target states, or multi pi skirmions. And um, in magnetic fields, we can get these localized or more stripped out skirmions. Um, and when we are using frustrated exchange interactions, we can actually stabilize um, isolated skirmions in the virgin state. Um, the second part of my talk, I was focusing on the higher order interactions, which I think are very exciting. And they can couple single Q states to triple Q states, for example, as in the case um, of the manganese monolayer. They can also lead to superposition walls in antiferromagnets and then determine their width and energy. Um, and I skipped this part. And um, I would like to thank um, several people. So the main persons involved in this work are Andre Kubetska, Juna Spiedmann, Marco Perini. We're all in the group of Professor Wiesendanger. And I would like to thank Stefan Heinze and his group for um, the nice collaboration and uh, the funding. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for this wonderful talk. Overall, we had about 100 participants here in the Zoom room and also on YouTube channel. Um, and I'm looking also forward to questions. So I will check the participants. Are there any questions? Please raise your hands or write them into the chat. So I see one from Gisela Schütz. Gisela, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So um, you measure at very low temperatures. Oh, first, thanks for this very, very exciting talk. <laughs> You, um, you measure at a relatively low temperatures, and I'm not an expert in STM, but for the technique itself, you need these low temperatures, or I, am I right? 
For the technique itself, no, you can do it at room temperature. You can also do spin polarized STM at room temperature. We've done this um, for the... Um, but it's also it's my, my question is uh, then, uh, uh, how is the temperature behavior of the phenomena you do you measured? Um, so in my lab, we haven't studied the temperature dependence. Um, so some of the materials I've shown, they just have a not so high critical temperature. So several of them will not be magnetic at room temperature anymore. There has been studies about the temperature dependent behavior um, of the skirmions in palladium iron. So it appears that at elevated temperature, they exist, but they start moving around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When they move around on a time scale um, faster than our imaging, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. one gets into trouble. So one can take time average data where we can still sort of see um, the probability where the skirmions like to be, but we can't really study dynamics. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions? So Kirsten, my question goes into a similar direction. So you mentioned that you have the single Q state and this multi Q state depending on like the higher order interactions. But what is the role of temperature in these arguments or also about any type of fluctuations in such statements? Um, so you have these higher order interactions and then if you go to the superposition state, if you, within the Heisenberg model, this one and this one, they are just degenerate, right? And the, the interaction that can um, make an energy difference between these two, they are the higher order interactions. So um, there's no additional um, temperature needed for the stabilization of this kind of perfect multi Q state. And I remember um, I think these, these skirmian lattices that were described as multi Q states, they, um, it was, to me, it was never so clear what actually was this stabilization mechanism that made the energy difference between the spin spiral, the one Q state and the multi Q state. I think maybe this is more your expertise. Yeah, so I can comment in the very early work, it was fluctuation stabilized. So there was the part about fluctuations that went uh, bring the energy lower for the screaming lattice phase. Um, but can you also comment on whether you can observe higher order Q modes? So this has been also done for the screaming lattice state and manganese silicide. With STM, you can probably not see this. What do you mean by higher order? So you can also have the lowest order Q modes when you look in momentum space, but in um, neutron scattering or so on, it has been observed that for the screaming lattice phase and manganese silicide, you can also observe higher order Q modes. These are uh, dynamic processes or are they st in the static. static spin structures? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if they are different in real space, then I think we should be able to see them, but I don't know how they look like. So. Um, I don't, uh, I see another question in the chat from Santish Kanguri, one moment. Um, you, um, you are now allowed to talk. Would you like to ask your question? Satish Kandukuri. Okay, then I can just read it. How are anti skirmian spin textures distinguished from skirmians in STM? Yes, um, it's a very good question. So maybe I go um, to this slide. So this is an isotropic material, just a hexagonal layer. So if we had an anti-skirmion, and for me, an anti-skirmion is something that has uh, two in and two out. I think there's different definitions. 
um, then this could be rotated in any direction on this kind of material. And then we should also see a two, we could also see a two lobe structure, but it should not be always aligned in the same direction. Um, and in, in the case that we have DMI, which we usually do, we don't expect anti um to exist in these high symmetry materials, right? You would need to have an uniaxial um, system where the DMI is different in one direction compared to the other direction, so different sign. And then you can have these anti skirmians and then they all line up in the same direction. Thank you. Are there further questions? Yes, I see another one from my... Uh... Waidavu, you can ask your question now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, actually, just want to follow up Karen's uh, questions. Um, when she mean when she asked about the higher order um, in neutron scattering, uh, higher order Q, I wonder if does that mean just um, deviation from sinusoidal structure? In other words, in, in your uh, SPSTM measurement, right? You see, this uh, like a sinus, not beautiful sinusoidal structure. But if you have a higher higher Q, higher order Q, does that mean it's have some deviation more like a more closer to like a square wave or some, you know, high, have a higher modulation? I wonder if that that's what you mean. And if that's the case, then then you have to have a, you know, higher spatial resolution in order to see this uh, deviation from sinusoidal structure. Okay, uh, I think. I know what you mean. I'm not sure if that question goes to me or to Kari. Um, so for a, um, to have, I mean, here we have a high resolution image of the structure. And while I didn't take line profiles here, I think it's close to a sine wave. And you think that um, for these higher um, Q, structures, this would deviate from a sign. Is that correct? Yes, yes. That's what I guess, but I'm not sure okay. whether that's the sort of what translate from the case space to the real space, right? The, the... Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you for this, for this information. Yeah, but anyway, thanks for the nice talk, very nice talk. Thank you. Are there further questions? So I don't see any further questions in the chat. Um, let me just check if someone has. I also don't see further people lifting their hands. So then thank you very much, Kirsten, for this wonderful talk. Thank you. And then we meet next week again.